implementation and maintenance of security is tedious, especially when runtime portion of it is concerned. For example, if you would like to be notified when a potential breach is happening, we are likely going to use a tool like, let's say, Falco. It's a great tool. It's potentially one of the best, if not the best tool of its kind. It allows us to define an infinite number of rules that, when one of them is met, will fire notifications. That is the problem. We have to define all those rules or at least accept a significant number of rules that are available out of the box. Essentially, we need to predict everything that should not be allowed to happen or, if you prefer the other way around, everything that is allowed. That is tedious and you are likely going to end up frustrated at the best in an asylum at first. After all, who can predict all the bad things that might happen and who is fully aware of all high and low level calls that applications are making? I certainly can't. There's a better way, a better approach. Instead of us trying to figure out what are all the things our application should and shouldn't be allowed to do, we can have a process that learns what normal behavior of an app is and assume that everything outside the ordinary is bad. After all, that's what we humans do. We define security rules based on what we know about our applications. However, we are unlikely to ever truly know, at least on the system calls level, what an application does. eBPF does not have that problem. We can have an eBPF process that watches every single activity of an application, collects all the data, no matter how high or low level that data is, and deduce that's what the application should be doing. From there on, that same process can notify us when something extraordinary happens. In other words, we can have an eBPF process that learns how an application behaves and notifies us if any out of ordinary behavior occurs. That's how we detect malicious actors. That's how we find out that someone or something breached our defenses. That's where Cubescape, or to be more precise, Cubescape's runtime threat detection comes into play. Cubescape itself is a Kubernetes security platform that I already explored in that video over there. Today, I will ignore all the good and the bad things it does. Instead, I want to focus on a single feature that was released recently. Cubescape runtime detection consists of three parts. The first one is anomaly detection engine that detects and alerts on any anomalous behavior. It does that by following our instructions of what is and what isn't an anomaly by learning the behavior of applications and reacting when a deviation occurs. Then there is behavioral analysis engine that identifies well-known attacks. It essentially tells us if someone or something is performing operations that are known to be malicious. And Finally, there is malware scanning that can scan for malwares, viruses and other stuff that might infect our system. Today, I will not only ignore Cubescape in general, but also all those runtime threat detections, but one. Today, I want to focus on the anomaly detection engine, which I will clumsily describe as a solution similar to Falco, but without parts that can cause nightmares. Oh, and before we continue, I should say that everything I will show today is open source. There is a commercial version with a few additional features, which is actually pretty good and probably worth your money. Nevertheless, today is all about open source. Let's see it in action. I already created a Kubernetes cluster and deployed an application. It's a silly demo application that when we send a request to it, does not hide how silly it is. Nevertheless, that silly demo will be more than enough to demonstrate how anomaly detection works. Now, let's say that I am a malicious actor that managed to gain access into the cluster and wants to list all the files and directories in the root of the container where the application is running. I would do that by first finding the name of the pod I'm interested in and executing kubectl exec with the ls slash command. Now, that is obviously not an operation that should be allowed, unless the application itself needs to be able to list files and directories. Maybe it does, or maybe it doesn't. 
As I already mentioned, I honestly do not know what are all the system level calls that application is doing. So even though executing LS is obviously something that should not be allowed, there are many other calls that should and even more of others that shouldn't. We will fix that by installing Cubescape operator through a Helm chart. But before we do that, let's take a quick look at the values I prepared. Over there, I'm enabling runtime detection since that's the only Cubescape feature we are interested in today. Further on, I set the max learning period to five minutes. In a real world scenario, five minutes would obviously not be enough for Cubescape to learn everything there is to learn about the application. By default, it is set to 24 hours, which should be more than enough for all the behavioral permutations that can happen and will happen. If your release frequency is once every couple of days, you might want to leave the default value of 24 hours. On the other hand, all of you advanced folks that are releasing more frequently might want to consider something in between. In any case, five minutes should be more than enough for a demo. Anything more than that would be a test of my patience. So we will keep it at five minutes. Finally, I enabled STD out exporter so that agents output alerts to logs and set alert manager exporter URL so that those same alerts are also sent to alert manager. Besides those two, we could also use syslog and uh, HTTP exporters, maybe a few others. And now we can install Cubescape operator by executing Helm upgrade. Okay, so now that Cubescape is running, it will spend five minutes learning about the behavior of the apps in the cluster. In production, there would be nothing for us to do since the application would be receiving real traffic. But since this is a demo, I will simulate traffic by executing hey for five minutes. So hey is now bombing the application with the requests and will continue doing so for a while. So let's fast forward to the end of those five minutes minutes. From now on, Cubescape knows what the normal behavior of the application is, and it will alert us when something abnormal happens. Since we specify that it should output warnings to STD out, we can see what's going on by retrieving logs from the node agent. And since we are interested only in one specific application, we'll grab silly demo. And finally, we'll make it pretty with uh, JQ. So far, nothing special happened. The only information we got so far is that it started to monitor on container and five minutes later it ended monitoring. Since by default the node agent is running as two replicas, we got two of those messages or we got messages in stereo. Other than the information that monitoring started and stopped, the node agent did not detect anything unusual. Let's change that. Let's execute the same LS process we run before. That one surely does not count as expected behavior. And also let's see what we have in the logs right now. Okay, so to be clear, exploring logs like those we saw is not ideal. Actually, it's so far from ideal that I would say that it's almost useless. I would not know what to do with them. And I certainly do not want to waste my time tailing logs 24 seven, just in case some anomaly is detected. Instead, I want to receive a notification when something's wrong on Slack or email or something similar. Cubescape, at least the open source version, does not have that capability baked in. We cannot tell it to send a message to Slack or something similar when something wrong uh, is happening. And even if we could do that, we would be swarmed with too many alerts and quite a few false positives. What we can do, though, is instructed to send alerts to alert manager. Actually, we already did that when we deployed Cubescape, so we can jump straight into it. We can see a few groups of alerts, but we are interested only in those coming from the A-team namespace since that's where the application is. Now, this looks wrong. It claims that there are 87 alerts, while logs showed only a few, and even those are too many since there are two replicas of the node agent effectively duplicating the alerts. I feel that the node agent keeps sending the same alerts to alert manager, which is bad, like really, really bad. Yet it's not a big problem by itself since we can group alerts. Since we are probably interested in the command, we can group alerts by that label. This makes much more sense. 
we can see that there are four distinct alerts. The one that matters is the ls command we executed as a way to simulate the unexpected. The rest are recurring alerts coming from Cubescape, but not directly related to what we are exploring today. Okay, so while logs on one hand are almost useless, alert manager is a much, much, much better destination, yet it's far from perfect. There are quite a few uh, fields that are not sent to alert manager and that's to be expected since alert manager is not supposed to be a dashboard where we observe stuff, but rather a gateway between the source of alerts, in this case Cubescape, and the destination, which can be Slack or email or almost anything else. Now, I will not go into details how to configure alert manager to send alerts somewhere. That would be a completely different subject unrelated with uh, Cubescape and which if you're interested then if you express interest in the comments, I would be more than happy to explore in more detail, but not in this video. Otherwise, I will assume that you are familiar with Alert Manager. So far, we saw that we do not need to tell Cubescape what is the expected behavior of our applications and we saw that it can notify us when something extraordinary happens. We also saw that out of the box it comes with rules that we might, but also rules that we might not need. We can change that as well through the runtime rules bindings resource that was created when we installed Cubescape. So let's take a look at it. The key is in the rules section. The unexpected process launched is the rule that detected that ls command was executed and that it is not considered a normal behavior since it was not executed during the learning period. Now, I won't go through the rest of the rules because they should be self-explanatory and if that's not the case, you can find a bit more, yet potentially not enough, information in the rule binding section in the runtime threat detection page in the documentation. Future releases should come with additional rules and more importantly, a mechanism to add custom rules and hopefully better documentation is coming as well. But what matters is that the key to all this are the application profile resources. So let's see what we have in the A-team namespace. Next, we'll store the name of the profile in the environment variable and use it to output it. That is the application profile where the information about the expected behavior of the application was stored after the node agent finished observing it for the given period. We can see through the labels that it is associated with the silly demo deployment inside the A-team namespace. That's the application itself. But that's also misleading since the profile is generated for the specific replica set and the next time we deploy a new release of the application, a new profile will be created after the learning period and that's both uh, good and bad, depending on how you look at it. Uh, it's, it's not pretty. So, here it goes. Since each new release of an application can change the behavior of the application, it makes perfect sense that each is initiating a new learning process and generating a new profile. That makes perfect sense, except maybe if you release very frequently, in which case the learning period might be just as long as the release frequency effectively resulting in constant learning without much alerting. Nevertheless, it makes perfect sense to repeat the same process for every release. The bad news is that the instruction in the logs to whitelist false positives in the profile is kind of silly since a profile is short lived. As a matter of fact, I would not even know where to start if I would want to whitelist anything. Now, I'm not saying that's not possible, but rather that it is not documented or explained anywhere. Or maybe I missed it. Anyways, I will blame documentation for that. Now, the good news is that we can ignore the application profile and instead silence alerts that are false positives in the alert manager. It might not be ideal, but it is doable and judging by the current state of the project, a preferable way to deal with alerts coming from Cubescape. Okay, so I feel that we had enough hands-on experience with Cubescape anomaly detection engine to give you an idea how it works. So let's move into my favorite part of every video and talk about the pros and cons and try to deduce whether you should adopt the project. Let me start by saying that what we saw in this video is the open source version of the project and that the commercial version solved some of, if not most, of the issues we are about to discuss. 
I invite you to explore it yourself since today the focus is only only and exclusively on open source. All I will say is that the commercial version is awesome and should be considered. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about the cons. To begin with, outputs are not great. Observing alerts and logs is almost impossible, at least directly. If you're shipping logs to a central log storage or location, like for example, Loki, you should be able to make sense of them through filters. If you do not use some centralized logging solution but plan to observe logs through kubectl logs, you are likely not going to be able to make sense of them. Sending alerts to alert manager is a much better, yet not a great solution either. I'm not sure what the final solution should be, yet I'm sure that something is missing to make sense of the alerts in an effective manner. The idea to edit the profile sounds silly. Should we edit profile after each release of an application? That sounds silly. And I feel that Cubescape should keep generating application profile and enable us or users to create a separate resource with byte listed processes that is persisted across releases. Next, I could argue that Cubescape is better or at least less demanding way to detect anomalies in behavior than Falco. However, just as Falco, it is limited to alerts. If someone enters the system and starts doing whatever malicious actors do, we will find out what's happening. I have no doubt about that. We might even stop that behavior, but we cannot prevent it. I feel that Cubescape should extend the existing mechanism to not only alert on potentially malicious behavior, but optionally prevent it in a similar way as CubeArmor prevents it. Since it is based on eBPF, I don't see a technical reason not to do so. Now, I do understand that many will choose not to enable prevention, especially early on. But as time passes and people start trusting the anomaly detection, anomaly prevention will become a desirable progression. Finally, there is no obvious or at least a documented way to transfer application profiles from one environment to another. Ideally, anomaly detection should work all the time in production and not only after the learning period, which as per recommendation is 24 hours. What might make sense is to run it in a separate environment, let's say staging, and once it is complete, move it to production together with the, the new release of the application. Now, I am fully aware that we could probably somehow hack it, but I'm ignoring that possibility since such an option is not even mentioned in the documentation. Now let's jump into good things, into pros. And there are quite a few positive aspects of Cubescape Anomaly Detection Engine, but today I will focus only on one, since that one is the real differentiator. Instead of forcing us to configure expected and unexpected behavior of each app, the engine learns what the expected behavior of the app is and considers anything else as unexpected. That might not sound like a big deal, but it is. That solves one of the biggest problems for the tools in that space. Now, judging by the number of cons and my complaints, you might deduce that Cubescape or at least Anomaly Detection Engine is not a good choice. That's not how I would uh, describe it. It's a young project, so it is to be expected that there are rough edges and that there are still some things for it to discover. I like the direction it is going. I feel that learning the behavior of an application is a much better approach than expecting us, humans, to know that and to define it in some configuration file. That feature has a lot of potential and I cannot wait to see how it will progress. So here's the TLDR. Try it out and let me know what you think. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.